Okay, so in this presentation, I would like to go through kind of the high points of differential diagnosis for um, hip dysfunction in physical therapy. Uh, just at the top of the document, uh, again, with all these differential diagnoses, I kind of want to remind us of pain descriptors and trying to differentiate between musculoskeletal pain or nervous system pain, or I call it neuromuscular here, and um, versus a non-musculoskeletal, for example, cancer or like red flag type pain that is not due to the musculoskeletal system. So those are kind of for your reference. Um, but again, we would expect musculoskeletal pain to be reproducible within our exam. We would expect it to be more of a mechanical type pain, so reproduced with certain movements, positions, and then it should have some easing factors or some things that alleviate it. So rest, ice, medications typically are what we think of. In the hip specifically, if we check out the hip, the area that we're going to focus on, some red flags are non-musculoskeletal screening that we want to be careful to work through in our head or as we're going through these differential diagnoses is regionally in the hip we're pretty close to the abdominal organs and specifically reproductive organs also um, gastrointestinal and genitourinary systems or organs related to those systems and so we want to be screening for pain or dysfunction related to those sorts of things so um, if pain is related more to eating or urination defecation, we might be thinking that it's not musculoskeletal. Um, if it's related to some sort of reproductive function, again, uh, it might lead us to involvement of those sorts of systems. We also want to be screening because the hip is geographically close to the lumbar spines. We're always in our heads thinking that any body area that we want to screen joints or regions above the body area of interest or the body area where the patient has their main complaint. And we always want to screen below, but above in this, in the case of hip, we really want to screen out lumbar dysfunction and uh, specifically red flags in the lumbar area are one of the main ones would be Cotoquina syndrome, which in which case we want to be asking about two different things, bowel or bladder changes or dysfunction, and then the presence of saddle paresthesia or saddle sign. Um, numbness, tingling, loss of sensation in the genital, genital area or where somebody would sit on the saddle. Um, and then bowel or bladder changes, our red flag would be tend to present as uh, either urinary retention or fecal incontinence. So being unable to urinate or not urinating for greater than 24 hours is a red flag, necessitates referral right away. Same thing with uh, fecal incontinence, that's, that's, there's no cause to that. Um, those sorts of things, recent onset symptoms would necessitate referral. So you're not going to treat that patient. It could be a sign for something more serious. They need to get checked out. Okay. The other thing we want to be careful about is uh, screening for presence of hernia near the hip. Um, and this could be um, in a couple different areas. So hernia just refers to uh, organ um, coming out of a space or protruding from a space that it's not supposed to be at or in. And so for males, it's common at the inguinal ring. So males will commonly experience a inguinal hernia versus females is more common as a femoral hernia um, in that space. So that's something you wanna screen for. Um, it could be, somebody could have an asymptomatic hernia and they might know about that. You might get that in their medical history, but if they're coming in with pain, and you suspect a hernia that hasn't been diagnosed, um, that will likely be a referral, and depending on the seriousness or severity of it, it could necessitate surgery. Sometimes hernias are managed conservatively or non-surgically, but um, that would probably be a collaborative effort with another healthcare provider. Okay, so getting into the diagnoses that we are going to be seeing and we're going to be treating most often as physical therapists, a um, couple quick general patterns that we see in these diagnoses are the location of pain um, as well as the pain descriptors. And these can help us start to differentiate or start to hone in on what are the structures uh, of interest or what are the pain generators. So I want you to pay specific attention to um, the location and also these pain descriptors. Sorry, I'm just kind of updating a little bit um, just to make these clear. So, Location-wise, anterior hip pain or groin pain, 
sometimes it will be described as a C sign pain if an individual places their thumb and finger in a C or just kind of points toward that area of the groin, so the anterior, maybe um, groin, hip area of the source or the location of their pain, and it usually tends to be intraarticular, so joint dysfunction um, at the hip or labral dysfunction, whether that's a labral tear or impingement, um, that is usually indicative of one of those sorts of issues. Versus a lateral hip pain, if somebody's pointing more towards the side of their hip, side of their leg, that tends to be an extra articular tissue or an extra articular involvement um, of muscle, tendon, bursa at that lateral hip. And um, we can talk about this generally and call it greater trochanteric pain syndrome. We'll talk about that a little bit below um, where maybe all or one of those structures is involved but tends to be structures that are not in the joint itself. They're outside of the joint, but they're surrounding that greater trochanter of the femur on the lateral hip. Another thing we wanna pay attention to is the quality of pain. So sharp pain or a pinch, a catch, tends to clue us in that maybe an intraarticular or joint-related dysfunction um, versus a dull, achy pain tends to describe extraarticular structures, muscles, tendons, even bursa tend to have more of a achy or diffuse pain pattern versus a localized sharp pain. Okay, so getting into the specific diagnoses, hip OA is one of the ones that we will see in physical therapy. So it tends to happen in older age. And these are a couple um, clinical prediction rules that correspond or have been tested uh, with clinical findings that tend to predict. So these are clusters of tests and clinical findings that tend to predict presence of hip osteoarthritis. Obviously an x-ray is gonna really help you. That's gonna be the gold standard for diagnosing this sort of thing. But these clinical findings can corroborate um, or maybe be a precursor to obtaining imaging because you suspect hip OA. So an older individual, um, you common think, commonly think about osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease affecting older individuals. So in fact, that's part of the second CPR. The other thing we see commonly, and this is a multiple joints with osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, is because of the pathophysiology, we have reduced joint space, usually our range of motion is limited. And at the hip, what we see specifically is that flexion range of motion and internal rotation range of motion seem to be preferentially impacted. So they tend to be the most limited ranges of motion for hip OA. So again, these show up on both of our um, CPRs for hip OA. Um, flexion, significantly limited, and then internal rotation. Um, if you think of normal internal rotation range of motion measurements, and obviously there's a range when we talk about any of these norms, but if you think of about 45 degrees to 65 degrees, something somewhere within that range, I usually tend to think closer to 45 degrees for most individuals, uh, internal rotation range of motion, less than 15 is a very significant limitation. And uh, the second CPR doesn't necessarily note the amount of dysfunction, um, but the, in this shorthand, I can clean this up for you guys. Sorry about that, that's just my shorthand, but there's a difference from one side to the other in, um, from, a, for example, a right hip to a left hip of greater than 15 degrees. So there's an asymmetry in internal rotation range of motion greater than 15 degrees. So say somebody's norm is 45 on the right, uh, their left hip is at 30 degrees, um, that might be suggestive of the left hip meeting this CPR for hip OA. Um, these individuals, again, they're going to be painful with joint compression, rotation forces, so a hip scour, so um, putting force within that joint, um, is going to be painful because the joint is the uh, pain generator is where we think the dysfunction is and then similar to other presentations of degenerative joint disease these individuals can have um, morning stiffness um, and they could have um, whoop sorry I just have a quick question here um, question about Cauda equina, why it results in urinary retention related to bowel and bladder function. So that's more of a 
neuro question. So I'm gonna actually put that off for a little bit later. I will come back. And if I don't get that to that at the end, I will come back and try to address that. But I do wanna get through some of these musculoskeletal related diagnoses. So thank you for the question. I'll come back to that. Okay, so hippo A, like I said, it might present with morning stiffness, similar to other degenerative joint issues. Um, and okay, so moving on to our other joint related dysfunction at the hip, um, another possible joint diagnosis, although it tends to be in younger individuals than this older age category of hippo A, would be FAI or femoral acetabular impingement slash labral tear. So these things can often coexist and or potentially predispose, FAI can potentially predispose somebody for having a labral tear. Um, so that's why I group them together is they're pretty intimately related um, and the impingement findings tend to be similar to labral tear findings upon exam. So this person, their chief complaint tends to be deep groin pain. So the anterior hip pain, again, like we saw in the, in the global pattern above. So anterior hip pain tends to be joint or groin pain. C sign where they're indicating the source of the pain at the groin. These individuals tend to describe a pinch, a click, or a catch, and that could be that torn labrum impinging, or it could be just an anterior impingement without a labral tear, uh, but it could be similar findings again. This could be trauma, or it could be a gradual onset. Sometimes it's described um, that FAR labral tears happen more preferentially in individuals that spend a lot of time in deep hip flexion and or internal rotation. So for example, catchers, um, baseball or softball catchers could be more predisposed. You might see this sort of pathology in them, hockey goalies, um, any, any sporting position where the individual is forced to spend a lot of time in this deep squat pattern could load that joint and cause irritation because of that loading pattern or position. The key findings on this are um, again, FAI, since it's a joint dysfunction, it's intraarticular. Um, the gold standard for diagnosis is going to be your x ray, labral tear, you're going to diagnose with a MRI because it's a soft tissue lesion, but FAI, um, because it is more of a bone lesion or bone buildup, um, can be diagnosed via x ray. And what the x ray will show is either a CAM or pincer lesion. So, CAM, sometimes being referred to as a pistol grip deformity where the femoral neck has an excessive amount of bone that's built up and that is what is impinging or that is what is reducing or limiting the amount of motion this individual has. Pincer lesion on the other hand um, is on the other part of the uh, articulation of that hip. So if you think of the femur, the head of the femur articulating in the acetabulum of the pelvis, um, the pincer is, pincer lesion refers to an abnormal buildup of bone around the acetabulum. And so the impingement is due to that rim of that acetabulum being extended. And so when you go into these deep ranges of motion, for example, deep hip flexion is often painful and as well as internal rotation. So I'm going to add that in here. So pain with um, end range hip flexion, oftentimes a deep squat is painful, and pain with end range, hip internal rotation are very common. Um, and those, those are actually, so if you're moving into flexion internal rotation or flexion external rotation, um, those are actually positions of this quadrant test. So that shouldn't be surprising as a special test for it tends to be, tends to follow these range of motion um, patterns that we see. Also hip scour is gonna be painful because the joint is what's irritated or painful. So again, compressing and applying some axial force to the joint is gonna be painful. Um, pain with a squat, and I'm gonna put in here, again, deep squat, because that's gonna uh, really stress the limits of somebody's loaded flexion and rotation range of motion at that hip. Also, Faber or Fabier, which are combination tests, flexion, external rotation, sorry, flexion, abduction, and external rotation, placing somebody in that position or a figure four position, or a fadir position will often be provocative, and those are special tests for this pathology. All right, so moving on to the soft tissue lesions. These we're thinking, uh, or at least for this next diagnosis, um, this is gonna be our lateral hip pain. So our lateral hip pain 
individual. Um, our first diagnosis that we're thinking of is greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which anytime we talk about a syndrome is a collection of signs and symptoms. So underneath this syndrome category or syndrome heading, we have a few structures that could be involved or culprits. And those structures are gonna be muscle, tendon, bursa. So gluteus medius muscle and tendon could be affected or related uh, in this pathology. Um, greater trochanteric bursitis or bursa irritation could be affected. And then because of the locality of it uh, and its attachment to the um, muscles in this area, the IT band could also be regionally contributing. So the IT band is going to run um, superficial to over that greater trochan area. And it's also going to run, um, well, it's going to attach, it's going to be an attachment to two of the primary muscles in this area. So the TFL, uh, as well as the glute max, are going to attach into that IT band. Um, it's going to be part of their distal attachments. And so because of that, this IT band, and because of the fact that the IT band has a lot of um, nerve innervation and nociception, it could be a pain generator, it could be a contributor to dysfunction that we see in the syndrome. So with the glute mean tendinopathy, um, and in fact for all of GTPS, common mechanism tends to be overuse or repetitive microtrauma. It could be walking, it could be running, anything where we're getting loading in that single limb stance, because if we remember, gluteus medius is a primary hip abductor, and as it works as an abductor, if that muscle is weak or if that muscle is overloaded, um, it can cause pain and dysfunction. And so if you stand on one leg, you are loading closed chain hip abduction, and this muscle can be prone to overuse for somebody who takes up walking and progresses their walking mileage too quickly, somebody who takes up running progresses that too quickly, and or there are training errors such as um, changing surfaces over which you're walking, so a lot more trail walking, walking up or down hills, same thing with running, uh, changing footwear, those sorts of things, or what we see in patient histories with these sorts of dysfunction. I will say that GTPS does also preferentially affect females over males, and it tends to be middle-aged females. Um, and somebody who is walking a lot or running a lot could be affected, but it could also be a sedentary individual who is trying to take up a fitness routine because they've been sedentary. Likely they have some weakness at not only this glute mean muscle, but the other muscles surrounding the hip. And because of that, um, as we know, some of the non-contractile tissues could become overloaded. So that tendon could become overloaded of the glute mead, but then also you could have some overload on these regional structures. So the bursa could become compressed, a T band could be overloaded. So those are some of the things that you see in mechanism and onset and history reports from these individuals. Tests for glute mead, muscle pathology, and tendinopathy are going to be consistent with how we diagnose any other contractile lesion. So there will be pain with active contraction and passive stretch. So um, actively having them perform hip abduction and resisting that motion will likely be painful. It's so will stretching into the opposite motion or stretching that muscle or tendon out. So stretching into abduction. So this is leg across the body is gonna be painful. If somebody's sleeping on their side, either on the side of interest could be compressing the bursa, so that could be painful or sleeping on the opposite side and letting the leg fall across the body, it's gonna move them into hip adduction. So that could be painful as well. So side lie sleeping is something that you'll oftentimes hear from these individuals that's a um, aggravating factor to their pain. These patients are gonna have a negative hip scour. In other words, compressing the joint isn't gonna bother them because it's not a joint problem. Single leg standing could induce pain for the reasons that we said um, that single leg stance is going to load the hip abductors in a closed chain position. And so if that's a sensitive structure, that's going to be a painful test. For somebody who has a bursa that's affected, uh, they're going to be tender at that bursa. This greater trochanteric bursitis um, or lateral hip bursitis used to be really a more common diagnosis. For some positions, it still is. But what we tend to see in the research actually for these sorts of issues, and I think why part of the motivation for 
calling it a syndrome or categorizing it as a syndrome is you can see one or many of these factors. What we tend to see is that preferentially or more common, the glute med, tendon, and muscle are affected. Bursa or bursitis tends to be affected in much fewer cases, all it does happen. It doesn't tend to be the primary source of discomfort or, or problem as maybe was originally thought. A T-band pain can be there, um, but again, I think the main, the main culprit or the main thing we see more often than not is this glute med tendinopathy. Um, IT-band pain, your special test for our IT-band syndrome, which is more often described at the knee, so I won't go into the specific IT-band syndrome, but suffice it to say that it could be a sensitive structure. But the special test for this would be a positive mobile compression test, where you manually compress the IT band and then passively flex and extend the knee. So again, that's more of an IT band test of the knee, but it could be positive if that T band is irritated or affected in these individuals. All right, so let's talk a little bit about muscle strains and pulls. At the hip, um, these are gonna reflect the muscles that are at the hip regionally. So hamstring strain posteriorly, hip flexor strain anteriorly, or an adductor strain for that medial thigh or medial hip groin area. Um, as I mentioned above, and as I tend to mention in many of my presentations, because I think it is such a useful algorithm and um, pattern to think through, is with these contractile tissue injuries or tissue lesions, just as James Syriax suggests that we diagnose, the common pattern we're gonna see is pain, painful muscle contraction or an active contraction will be painful or provocative and a, a passive stretch will be as well. So if we think about these different muscles, where they're located, what their actions are, that's gonna be the pattern that we're gonna see. So having somebody contract or performing a resistive test on the muscle of interest, whether it's the hamstring, hip flexor, or hip adductor, those should all be provocative, as well as placing these individuals into a stretch position or passively stretching their hamstring, hip flexor, or adductor, depending on what muscle tendon unit is involved, should all be provocative. Um, specifics to these areas that are maybe a little bit more nuanced are with a hamstring strain or hamstring pull, the mechanism of injury that we tend to see described is uh, a sprinter or quick movement, quick jump, for example, and the patient will describe hearing a pop, feeling a pop, or pulling up short in a sprint and then um, limping after the fact or after the injury. Uh, it's usually, this injury is usually with a quick or a high force load. And a lot of times it's with an eccentric load on that hamstring muscle. If you remember the function of the hamstring muscle uh, at the end of the swing phase is to actually decelerate an extending knee or an extending lower limb. And so in a sprint, that hamstring is really, really loaded, uh, both as a hip extender for push off, but also as a knee, controlled knee, uh, eccentric extension. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think you guys get the gist. So that mechanism for hamstring strain is pretty common. Other things you'll see for a hamstring pull or a hamstring strain in the findings, either in the observational findings or objective session of your exam is, for grade two or grade three hamstring strain, you'll tend to see a bruising at the posterior thigh, and in some cases, quite a bit of bruising. So very significant black and blue mark in that area. Um, you could feel a nodule or feel a ball or point in that muscle, kind of feel where that tear was, like a divot or a nodule, uh, in a more severe strain or pull where those muscle fibers have been torn. Um, and then you're gonna have pain with MMT and stretch on the muscle, just like we said. Hip flexor strain is going to be painful in the anterior thigh, um, into the groin, depending on which hip flexor has been affected, rectus femoris or iliacus, so as um, tensor fascia lata, TFL. So those specific hip flexors are going to have different attachments, and you're going to want to palpate where the tendon attaches into the into the bone, but also you're going to want to palpate on the front of the thigh to try to differentiate, though that's a little bit harder. Um, Mechanism injury tends to be deceleration mechanism, again, more of an eccentric load on that muscle tendon unit, um, but different than hamstring, we're thinking about 
a different motion because of the muscle's action. So kicking a ball or decelerating into hip extension. So having something move you forcefully into hip extension could stretch and could strain that those that muscle group or one specific muscle that performs hip flexor action. Um, these individuals are gonna have pain with the resistive testing and stretch. That's our pattern. For these injuries, you really wanna rule out, try to rule out as best you can an avulsion fracture because sometimes that will be a confounding presentation. That tendon is gonna tear away a piece of the bone at its insertion. So you're gonna to wanna to palpate at the AIS and the ASIS for these specific hip flexor muscles. So rectus femoris at the AIS and TFL at the ASIS. Um, to try to see whether they're painful at their insertion point. Um, and also palpate the tendon to see if it is more of a tendinopathic issue. If you do suspect avulsion, um, the test of choice would be fracture imaging. So for an individual who's not responding to conservative treatment um, with a hip flexor strain, and actually for any of these pathologies that involve the muscle tendon unit, you do want to rule out avulsion fracture. So with a high hamstring strain, you want to rule out avulsion from the ischial tuberosity where that hamstring muscle group attaches. For a hip adductor muscle strain, hip adductor muscle strain, you want to rule out avulsion um, on the pubic bone, depending on the hip adductor muscle that you're testing or that you suspect. Um, so for hip adductor muscle strain, again, this often happens with either kicking where you're decelerating and that muscle's moving into a lengthened position at high load or at high speed, or twisting motion with the leg planted. So if you think about a twisting, um, if you plant your right leg, and you turn away from that right leg, that's gonna stretch or put stress on that adductor muscle group as the leg is moved into a closed chain abducted position. It's a common mechanism of injury. So a plant or a cut is not uncommon for this sort of muscle injury as a mechanism. Um, they're gonna be tender at that muscle. And again, resistive testing is gonna be provocative uh, as well as stretching. Okay. Sports hernia is something that we want to check for. Um, sports hernia and athletic pubalgia are terms that are not incredibly well defined, or some people define them very specifically, but I would say they're not used consistently across the literature. And so what I've done here is I've kind of combined these terms and combined these categories. And what this tends to refer to, so um, as I mentioned above, a true hernia refers to an organ exiting outside an orifice that it doesn't normally exit from. So it's outside of the place that it should be, usually moving through some sort of opening. Uh, a sports hernia, on the other hand, refers to a muscle pull or a muscle strain. And that could either be, depending on where you're looking, that could be an adductor muscle strain, or it could be an abdominal pull or an abdominal muscle strain. Um, so it's not a true hernia, which is the key. It's a muscular, it's a muscular issue instead of being an organ issue. These individuals are gonna present with groin pain. It could be a quick motion, again, because it's a muscle strain or muscle issue. There are gonna be similarities to this category we just went through. Um, and because of the insertions of the adductors, uh, but also the common insertions of some of the abdominal muscles, these individuals are likely gonna have some sort of pelvic pain. So whether it's a pubic synthesis pain, where you have attachments or, um, at, at the pubic bone, you do have attachments. Pubic synthesis, you have attachments of the abdominal muscles, rect, um, rectus abdominis. But also the pubic synthesis, because of its regionality, could be a finding, if, even if you have a muscle pull, muscle strain that is a sports hernia, um, you could have a pubic synthesis pain or strain as well. So a little bit of stress at that joint that's concurrent to this muscle pull. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, muscle injury, soft tissue injury versus an organ injury, like a true hernia. This next diagnosis, myalgia parasthetica, is a nerve injury or it's a nerve dysfunction. And specifically, it's an entrapment of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So the, this is a sensory only nerve that runs down the lateral thigh. So it runs under the inguinal ligament and that's commonly where this entrapment occurs is below the inguinal ligament. So anything that compresses that inguinal ligament or compresses around, if you think of somebody's waist um, or around their 
maybe their hip area, if you put your hands on your hips, anything that causes compression through that area could place extra tension um, on this nerve and cause nerve symptoms. So if you think of a tight belt, um, tight yoga pants, skinny jeans, pregnancy actually can compress this area because of the extra uh, tissue and baby there pushing on this area. Um, obesity, all of these things have been demonstrated clinically as case studies or in the literature to cause this presentation. So because it's sensory only, you're not gonna have any motor dysfunction from injuring or compressing this nerve, it's all gonna be sensory. So these individuals are gonna describe buzzing, paresthesias, could be numbness, could be tingling at the lateral thigh, which is gonna be the innervation territory for this nerve, for the sensory nerve. Uh, if you put slack on the inguinal ligament, so if you reduce the source of compression, if somebody has a tight belt and that's what's causing it, you take their belt off, it's gonna relieve their symptoms. Um, if pregnancy is the cause and they give birth, should relieve their symptoms. If this individual has, is wearing tight pants um, and it's, it's constant that they're wearing these, so just taking them off is probably not gonna make the symptoms go away forever, but it should relieve some of the symptoms. And if they stop doing that activity or stop having that compression constantly, uh, that's, your treat that's your main treatment for this, and it should relieve symptoms. So um, the test for this is having somebody in sideline and putting slack on the inguinal ligament. So pushing their um, hips together to put slack on the inguinal ligament. So a positive pelvic compression test is what this is called. Uh, they're gonna have a negative neuro screen for nerve root involvement. And again, they're not gonna have motor symptoms for this specific um, diagnosis. Okay, so a few more to get through. If we don't get to treatment at the end, those are there for your reference. But I did wanna spend some time with the intra-articular and then the muscle dysfunction because that's the majority of what you're gonna see. So next diagnosis, coxus soltens or snapping hip. Um, I wanted to bring up, it's not as common, but it does refer to a snapping or a moving of a tendon over a bony prominence. So this could either be an internal coxus soltens, typically described with the psoas, tendon um, moving over the, the lesser trochanter of the hip, um, or it could be an external coxus soltens where the IT band moves across in a flexing and extending hip, moves across that greater trochanter, and the individual experiences snap. Um, person could have pain with this or they may not. Likely if they're coming into your clinic, it's probably painful, um, but it could be that they just say, oh, my hip snaps, and other than that, it doesn't really bother them. A few pediatric uh, the next few diagnoses are pediatric diagnoses that, I, that we need you to be aware of. So the skiffy or slipped capital femoral epiphysis could be present in a younger individual. So um, 10 to 16 year old is the age range that I have roughly in there. And this, similar to the diagnosis below it, so leg calf Hertz disease, these both tend to happen or tend to present as a pediatric individual not really an acute mechanism of injury. So an insidious onset where this individual starts experiencing hip pain or groin pain and their presentation tends to be um, reduced weight bearing on that extremity. So it's painful to put weight on that side because of this intraarticular issue that's going on. They're, sl they're slightly different intraarticular issues but it still causes pain at that hip. And so these individuals are gonna limp coming into you. Um, with a skiffy, they're gonna have increased external rotation. Uh, could be an obese individual, they could have medial knee pain. Um, because of the nature of this injury, you wanna refer them right away. You don't wanna treat this individual. So treatment for it is surgery, you wanna refer. Same thing with leg cap purse, um, but what's affected here is that there's a flattening or there's an avax vascular necro necrosis of the femoral head, and that's what's causing the dysfunction, both the pain and also the, um, decreased internal rotation, increased in external rotation. Third pediatric diagnosis is hip dysplasia. Um, this is something you're likely not going to diagnose, but the test for this, the uh, medical test for this are the Barlow test and Ortolani's test. Um, this is more common in females, more common if a breech birth, birth was, was took place. Um, this, this young pediatric patient would likely have a waddling or a limping gait. A couple other diagnoses, uh, hip fracture, which 
probably more common, but again, we're not going to diagnose. It's going to be a traumatic injury. They're likely going to know that they have a serious injury, so they're going to seek care from a physician. However, if you suspect a hip fracture and they haven't sought care, they don't have an x-ray, that, that older individual may have a limb that looks shorter and it could be internally rotated and flexed. So that might necessitate a referral, tra traumatic. MOI in an older individual, send them for an x-ray if you suspect that. Osteitis pubis, you present with groin pain. Um, it's an inflamed pubic symphysis, so they're gonna be tender to palpation at the pubic symphysis. Um, again, not as common, but a diagnosis to be aware of. So I'm gonna give a link to this document at the end of the